Alright, so we're back. Gonna talk some more about this game. And we'll pick up where we left off. Uh, going into the second chapter. Spoilers. Dear Esther, I have now driven the stretch of the M5 between Exeter and Bristol over 21 times. But although I have all the reports and all the witnesses, and have cross The reason I think this game is interesting, and I, I think it's worth talking about, is has to do with how the story is told and what story is really there. Break services. But although I can always see it in my rearview mirror, I have as yet been unable to pull ashore. I uh, think this story is being told in an unconventional way. Especially when compared to something like in film and so forth. This is a type of storytelling that I think only really works in video games. So, what I think we're being given here is uh, the possibility of having a story without having a plot. Maybe I can explain what I think that means and why it's not really completely nonsensical. I think it's pretty clear in this game that plot is absent. It's completely absent. You know, we have these bits of voiceover and so forth that give details about what happened uh, between Esther and the narrator. Uh, but, you know, these are just hints, basically. Um, and certainly what we're doing, traversing the world, we're not moving the plot in any sense. If we look at cinematic storytelling in other games, we'll see, you know, we'll see things like uh, cutscenes and uh, acting. We'll see protagonists and antagonists, and they will, you know, the, the antagonists will force the protagonists to make decisions and so forth. But the decisions that are there don't really affect uh, plot details. Barnacles mindlessly clinging to a mercy seat. Why cling so hard to the rock? So we have to ask what the voiceover is doing uh, for the game. And I don't think it's moving plot. It's not, you know, the characters aren't doing things. He's just talking about things that happened and thoughts that he's having uh, about what those, these events that the narrator had no control over, really, what they mean. I think the purpose of this voiceover is to add weight. It's uh, maybe supplementary to uh, what's going on. Uh, it's adding weight to the location, the, the feeling of the location, the feeling of uh, whatever it is that happened, and it's impressing these emotions upon you and sort of clarifying them in a way that you might not get just walking through this sort of desolate island. So is the point of the voiceover supplemental at all, or is it actually trying to give you details about what happened? I mean, is it sort of a mystery that you're trying to figure out, a puzzle that you're trying to solve? Um, I think, you know, there are puzzle elements to it, for sure. It's actually, you know, it's definitely giving... Uh, these puzzle pieces and you can combine them and uh, figure out parts elements of what happened but I just don't think that's the main point of the voiceover so what we're left with is is this a story or is this actually I had uh, something like an art installation where the uh, you go I'm into a museum and, and you see this video playing and you put the headphones on and, and you just sort of experience the, it and it's sort of like a moving painting. You're just supposed to feel it. Um, the reason that I want to sort of give some weight to the hypothesis that this actually is something like storytelling is... We're not just feeling emotion in a raw sense. What we're getting is sort of a window peek into a character show, and how I the character the of the narrator who has all this guilt about something that happened and whether it's his fault or somebody else's because of alcoholism or if it's something that actually isn't his fault, like uh, the brake system failing. And so you have all these details, but they're all polarized towards one thing. And therefore, the point of all of this is not to figure out the puzzle pieces. 
the point is to feel the aftermath of the character. You're you're supposed to experience the character's turmoil over whatever this was that happened. The western side. Now, having said all that, there are puzzle elements to this in the sense that something did happen. And while I'm not sure that there is a definitive answer as to what happened, I think there actually um, there's there there have to be red herrings, and uh, or maybe you can't call them red herrings because you're just given these details and you're supposed to formulate what the story is. And I think that's another thing that video games can do that's harder to do in film. Now it's not impossible to do in film. You have films like Cloverfield where the plot of the story, uh, sort of like Dear Esther but for trivial reasons, uh, the, the plot is to get from point A to point B. You're trying to, I think, save your girlfriend or whatever, um, or the protagonist is trying to save his girlfriend. So you're doing that, but behind all of that is this mythology, much like in Dear Esther, of what caused all these events to transpire. You know, what happened? What is the cause of this? And in Cloverfield, you don't have the protagonist figuring it out. The protagonist doesn't even really care. You, as the audience member, see these details in the background through military chatter and uh, through just things that the characters in a movie miss. They miss it, but you can see it and you can figure out these puzzle elements. And they're there for you, not for the characters. Um, so it can be done in film, but I think video games are uniquely uh, able to do this. I haven't played The Last of Us yet. Uh, it's on my list of things to play, but my understanding is there's lots of this sort of stuff. You're you're trying to uh, survive, but all the while you're stumbling across these pieces of people's lives that are only visible for this brief moment where you see this window onto them, and all you see is that window, and then and then you don't know anything else about them. And it sort of creates uh, the world that you're in. And uh, going back to Cloverfield, I mean, that's that's how all that mythology is built. And, uh, you know, you have other instances like it uh, in, in other games, but we'll get to those in a minute. But uh, we're coming up to an example of this in this game, uh, where we find all of this uh, stuff here and uh, all these things they imply the story. That's where the story is, is implied. You have this book here um, by Maurice Maeterlinck. Uh, this is like a Russian translation of this poet and playwright's complete works. And you've got this sonogram here. Uh, uh, what looks like a sonogram, but you know, you can't really see a fetus. And so you that leads you to question things. It leads you to think about things, well, maybe... Uh, maybe Esther was pregnant uh, when if if she died. Uh, maybe she was pregnant at the time. And there's another these sonogram pictures. But uh, that brings up the topic of uh, this book um, that we we keep stumbling across here. Uh, this poet and playwright wrote stories that were sort of related to the symbolist movement. Here's another shot of it here. Uh, and, uh, symbolist movement, I guess, in, like, the late 19th century, maybe. And, uh, I think this is a very explicit hint as to what the developers of this game, or I guess a mod originally, what they were trying to do, and what kind of story they were trying to tell. So, uh, the way that this symbolist movement relates to, uh, fiction is in a way that I've always sort of termed in my head uh, as Anno's epiphany. Um, and that's uh, Anno, the the developer of the anime Neon Genesis Evangelion, uh, where you have all these details, you know, you're, you're given these details that are sort of hidden and obscured. And, uh, and by doing that, by not bringing the story out explicitly and making it clear to the audience, 
uh, you allow the audience to actually construct part of the story. And in so doing, you allow the audience to actually have an investment in the story. Uh, and I think leaving these elements in allows the, the player, in this case, to, to appreciate the story in a way that's impossible uh, to appreciate uh, if they have all of these details just handed to them and, and all the answers this are given. Be. Now, yeah, I think why this is so important in games is because it creates this sort of feedback loop of uh, motivation where uh, the player sees these elements, uh, these bits of story, and they sort of make it their own, and that pushes them to go farther in the game and to achieve more in the game. And it's this feedback loop that is sort of like the magic sauce of games, I think. Uh, when when story really does connect in a way that makes the gameplay elements sort of come together in a way that they wouldn't otherwise. They found and uh, a game three. series that I think does this well is uh, the Portal dead, series, where all of these sort of uh, nerves, ancillary parts of the story, the these motivations to, to, to make you realize that possible. you're actually... You know, not going to get cake at the end. All these bits are, are hidden and they're just breadcrumbs sort of uh, uh, spilled to lead you to them. But that motivation to save yourself in the end is your responsibility. It's the player's responsibility to decide that, you know, in, in Portal 1, no, I'm, you know, I'm going to resist. And for me, at least, that moment where you decide I'm going to save myself is just so pitch perfect in that case. But there's sort of a, an inverse example in the case of Shadow of the Colossus, Climbing where the caves, you have your typical front, motivations for, name. you know, defeating these monsters, defeating these bosses, and it's only at the end do you realize, you start to get these hints uh, from the story that's unfolding, you know, so late in the game, that you might not have been justified in having acted the way that you have and being motivated in the way that you were uh, for most of the game. So this sort of complex of motivation is inverse because you're realizing that you didn't have the proper motivations, and uh, but because you're so close to the end of the game, you most likely will end up finishing anyway because the stakes seem so high, even though you don't really know what the stakes are. Um, but anyway, uh, it looks like we're coming to the end here. So, uh, we'll dive into the caves, uh, for part three. Um, again, I appreciate you watching and, uh, please comment if you disagree or, you know, have, have something that I didn't think about, uh, with any of this stuff, uh, and, uh, like, uh, dislike, <laughs> uh, subscribe, uh, if you so choose. And, uh, we'll go in here. Geronimo. Donnelly did not pass through the caves. From here on in, his guidance, unreliable as it is, has gone from me. I understand now that it is between the two of us and whatever correspondence could be drawn from the wet rocks. <laughs> <laughs>